Welcome to the A16Z Podcast. I'm Michael Copeland. Virtual reality is coming fast, and everyone seems to assume that it will be gamers who get to have all the fun first. But there are other applications for VR that could also bring it into the mainstream. It could very well be business users, says A16Z's Chris Dixon. It's anything where you would want time travel or teleportation, he says. Dixon is joined on this segment of the podcast by Saku Panditaratne and Kyle Russell, both on the firm's deal team, to offer their perspective on how virtual reality is likely to enter all of our lives. 2016 promises to be the year when more than a very small number of people will get their first taste of VR. What does VR look like and feel like? And what does that shared experience set in motion on this segment of the A16Z podcast? Chris Dixon starts the conversation. The first question is, um, kind of where are we in terms of VR, um, uh, you know, like the, the Oculus and, uh, and Valve are launching this year. Um, there's gear and cardboard. Maybe Kyle, um, you know, can you kind of talk, talk about the, the current landscape? Yeah. So last fall, we saw the launch of the Gear VR, which is compatible with Samsung phones. And it's kind of the prototypical mobile VR headset. You take your high-end smartphone, you slot it in. It provides optics that make the flat screen on your phone into a, an immersive uh, screen that kind of you know fills your vision uh, and also adds some motion sensors so that its tracking of your head is more accurate. Uh, and then you know, uh, last month and then this month, um, the Oculus Rift and uh, HTC Vive uh, were both, the pre-orders were announced respectively. Uh, those are kind of the high-end approaches to VR. They hook up to a high-end gaming PC. They provide positional tracking, which means that it tracks not only how you turn your head, but how you move forward, backward, to the side, which means you have kind of a more immersive experience. You can see things from different angles. Uh, it feels like you're in the world because you can move relative to it. Uh, no, so both of those are having their initial launches this spring. Uh, Oculus, the first units will ship in March. The Vive, the first units will ship in April. Um, and so it's kind of low. I, I think of it as low end and high end. And then the high end is Oculus, HTC Vive, Valve Vive, and uh, the rumored PlayStation. And the low end is gear and cardboard. And eventually, obviously, these will probably converge and they'll all have features like positional tracking. But for this year, there's sort of a separation, right? Yeah, no, you, you talk to anyone, and this is one of the things where uh, leaks are kind of slowly but surely making their way out of Apple and Google. Um, you'll see lots of great scoops coming from, for instance, the Financial Times has done one for Apple and Google recently, where uh, it's clear that they have hundreds of people working on these. And uh, when it comes to what kinds of hardware they're working on, they do want to bring the parts of the high-end experience, the things that we consider like the differentiators that give immersion presence, however you want to describe that, bring that down to mobile. Because I think everyone understands that the mobile plat mobile as a platform is, you know, 10 times larger than desktop will ever be. And while the capabilities today of desktop VR are really impressive, if you want to become truly mainstream, you want to reach people who have smartphones. I think the feeling is the next couple of years will be the years of VR for, for gamers and for prosumers. So people who are really enthusiastic about VR are the ones who have the high-end version. And um, like the mobile is just like a teaser for the general popular. So what, like, let's just go into some detail. So for example, um, the we, we've tried all these demos, the, um, the Oculus, sort of the consumer toy box um, is an incredible demo. A lot of the Valve demos are really good where you have room scale. Um, you know, one thing I'm excited about is this is, this is these demos have been available, you know, for kind of non-public trials. Um, they'll finally be public. And even if, you know, only, I don't know, a million people get these devices this year, um, maybe 10 million will get to try it. And, you know, some s significant subset of those might go start companies. Um, and so you sort of have this really interesting period happening. Um, but, um, but maybe, yeah, maybe we can give a sort of a flavor for what um, – these the demos feel like in the high end and low end i think the really critical difference between low and high end is that the high end vr actually achieves presence so you feel like you're you know it tricks your lizard brain to thinking you're actually there i think with mobile we're not quite there yet so it's it's a little it's sometimes yeah it's kind of so when you say presence that's a that's a term of art in vr which mm -hmm. refers to just kind of what what people have found through empirical testing is just that once you get sort of there's a threshold a minimum threshold mm -hmm 
of kind of enough of your senses are f- tricked that you just you sort of you, you your a bit flips and your brain says I'm now in this virtual world as right. opposed to I'm standing here looking at a uh, screen. Right. So mobile VR, it's it's this pixelated video. It's um, interactive experience that's kind of game like and has graphics from the late 1990s video games or maybe you know PlayStation 2 uh, right when it first came out. Um, and then you work your way up the spectrum and you have these higher end uh, headsets that do give presence. And now kind of the discussion is around, uh, okay, so positional tracking, you're seated, but it's, you can move your head around and you feel like you're there. Okay, that's great. Now let's start talking about standing up experiences and room scale. And when we talk about room scale, we're talking about Oculus Rift with several cameras and it can track you as you move around in a, let's say, three by three or five foot uh, by five foot space. And you, it's almost like having like, you can interact with parts of the room around you. And then you graduate up to, you know, what we would call, I guess, true room scale, which is what you have from day one on the HTC Vive, which is it has sensors that you place in the corners of the room and you can have up to 15 by 15 feet space. And you can actually walk, oh, I'm gonna go look at that thing over there and actually physically walk over instead of using a controller to move your avatar. I mean, this is one of the important things, I think, when you've tried these things, like some of the critics, most of whom I think haven't tried the the high-end VR, compare VR to 3D TV. Um, There's, you know, with the low-end devices, it is a little bit like 3D TV in that you have just this sort of, you know, you have this parallax effect, but it's only for far away, it's for far field objects, right? With the with the high end, you actually are able to like literally walk around like this. You know, you're sculpting something like in the medium demo or in one of these. Um, you're sculpting an object that you're actually able to walk around completely, and it just feels like that object is there, and the, and it feels like that in a very um, intense and um, uh, you know kind of. Um, yeah, I think about it in terms of way. like marginal change in experience. Where if you're looking at mobile VR, it's a step up from the kind of video where you move your phone around you. Um, but it still, at times, can feel gimmicky. It really depends on implementation, but it's not that revolutionary of an experience. It's a teaser. But then when you move up to, okay, software as this world I'm stepping into, and you know, you, one of the kind of frequent things you'll see that you know, where people who were skeptics came out impressed was they thought to lean against a virtual table to you know look yeah. at something even higher, or they thought to put uh, yeah. their controller down on a uh, you know a, a virtual couch, and they forgot that it wasn't real. Um, that's kind of where you start to hear just like the hints of oh, this is why it's so powerful. I think one thing that's interesting is that in VR, because of the threshold is so binary, uh, a lot of the technical problems are about getting over the threshold. So whether that's in capture or rendering or any of the or even the headset technology. Um, it's really key to have like be over that threshold to get presence. So let's talk about the the unsolved problems in VR because the so the big companies are working um, primarily it seems on headsets. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a whole kind of chain of of things that need to be built out, including content creation. Um, you know what's going on there? Yeah, so with um, so with tools, it's like there's a debate whether VR content is either going to be captured from a camera or whether it's going to be rendered like a video game, or whether like like films are today, it's going to be a mix of both. But um, it, despite whichever one is ultimately becomes the winner, like still the tools need to be built out. So right now, it seems that like most of the people make, doing VR content are using game engines like Unity and Unreal, or they're gravitating towards 360 or like field video. And so those seem to be like the main categories for creating. But there's all sorts of, uns- I mean, there's companies working on it, but there's a lot of work to be done, right? Like there's right. a lot of opportunity for new things. Like for example, um, like, you know, it's a difficult compression problem, for example, there's a ton more data than you normally have. Right, like you know, light field technology is, is like an emerging field. Can you, can you right? explain what that is? So light field is, um, it's a way of capturing video, which also takes into account the angle at which you look at an object. So it's more similar to a hologram than a th- than a than a video. So, um, but you know, as you can imagine, if you capture more than just um, you know your view, you have to capture an object from all different views. That's a lot of data, and so that's really overwhelming for the current video streaming infrastructure that we have. So it's going to be a way to make that smaller, um, easier to capture, also edit because it's you know it's very different from what we have. Before. And then there's like so for example, like you mentioned, how movies today are a combination of filmed and rendered mm-hmm. content. Like one of the demos I saw was you're at a basketball game and they're real basketball players and it's filmed and it's mm-hmm. filmed in 
ideally in light fields, so you have a full 3D and you can move around and it feels like you're there, but then you're sitting next to your virtual friends, right? Instead of sitting next to strangers, you're sitting next to your friend who actually is in, you know, my friend's actually in Moscow and Chicago and whatever. And, but we're all sitting there. And so there's part of it is sort of this real thing and part of it is virtual. Right. Um, it's like the, like the space jam type mixture yeah. And how do you do all of that? It's a very hard problem to mix right. all of that. And, and, and there haven't been tools. There, aren't, there aren't tools yet. I mean, even um, the other thing with you know creating VR f um, movies and films and games is that performance is so important because we have to be above this presence threshold. So you need a really really high end game engine to be. Which able is basically to do. ninety frames per second, like right. this what Oculus mm -hmm. is running, right? Which is higher than than most game consoles, for example, right. and movies. So it's it's just a higher threshold. So if you're doing a film, you you know you can take as as long as you want to render it. So it's like a different type of tool chain, which will probably be needed there. And even if you're not talking about light fields, if you're just talking about traditional video, but you're stitching together 360 degrees worth of footage captured on what are essentially, you know, like the old-fashioned Google, the Google Jump, like right. the, the Google, yeah. yeah, so Google Jump was a collaboration with GoPro where you're taking a set of, you know, let's say 15 GoPros and then st sticking them to a rig and then stitching the video from all of them together. Um, one... 15 cameras worth of 4K footage is a ton of data. Uh, the tools for stitching them together in a way that doesn't have really stark lines between the different cameras they capture, uh, that is actually a pretty tricky to problem solve. And then when it comes to, as Saku mentioned, streaming, um, even streaming one 4K video is really intensive for most people's uh, data connections. So you're starting to see really clever solutions where, uh, you know, you look at how people transcode video today, uh, they'll have, let's say, uh, high and low end versions of views. Like, say you have a, a 360 degree video, they'll break it up into 30 different views. And as you look to different places, it'll switch to the high resolution stream for that specific way you're looking. And so you have to have on the back end stored all 30 of those different views and then have uh, a system that can switch between them quick enough that your connection can keep up. And that's, you know, Facebook has recently open sourced their efforts on it. Uh, NextVR has done some really interesting stuff for their live streaming of sporting events. But there's still a lot more work to be done in terms of uh, tools to do that for live events and also just to continue to improve the quality and make it so that, you know, you don't actually have to be connected to your home Wi-Fi on a gigabit connection uh, to have like a perfect experience. I thought one of the coolest things I saw lately was that Unreal video um which was a, a demonstration of using VR to actually create 3D content, right? Because I think the the metaphor people, the, the assumption people had made kind of before was you would use a 2D screen with Unity or Unreal, um, create 3D content the way we have always have, and then export it to VR, right? And this idea actually inverts that, right? And you're creating in 3D, maybe even for a 2D, um, uh, maybe even for content that's ultimately consumed on a screen or maybe something in the real world. Maybe you're making an airplane wing, right? And if you think about using AutoCAD today, like it's a very, it's a very difficult thing for people to learn who aren't experts in 3D modeling because you're having to work on a 2D screen. And so the idea kind of Iron Man style that you can work in a 3D environment, I thought was a very, very um, exciting possibility. Yeah, that's you, what, like that's what's interesting in terms of talking about input, you know, uh, it's a new paradigm and it's tricky to develop for, but you look at a mouse and it's a, it's a motion tracking like hand controller yeah. that only works on a plane. Yeah. And so, like, if you put it in those senses, like, yeah. well, actually, that's kind of a really awkward way to interact with lots of. Well, and you've got, and, and the thing is, you've got millions of people who use AutoCAD using this this two D hand controller, the mouse, this this primitive two D hand controller, right? <laughs> and they've learned over years, going to school and everything else, how to do it. And those people, by the way, would be happy to pay. They pay thousands of dollars per per you know for their rigs, tens of thousands of dollars for their machines and their software and everything. Like they'd be very happy for a high end. I think CAD, for example, just no brainer is going to move to uh, VR in the next yeah. couple of years. So, so to help visualize what this looks like for people again who haven't seen these videos or tried these experiences, um, imagine you know you're building a replica of your living room and you have a selection of couches and sofas and TVs and fireplaces that you could drop into a room. To to build it up to look like your room and you want it maybe the scale isn't quite right you could you know pick up your couch with these motion tracking controllers and then use essentially 3d pinch to zoom to rescale and it feels much more naturalistic than messing with parameters or you using a mouse wheel to adjust how big something is pressing command plus 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 until it looks kind of right yeah and i think it, it might be the right time now for these kind of prosumer tools because you know real vr isn't going to reach most people for a couple of years 
And so it's not going to be a mass market thing until then. So it might be the specialists who have a real need for these tools who might want to use it in the next coming years. Yeah. People, people just this assumption that it's all going to be gamers, I think, is just is highly to me is highly questionable. I mean, it could very well be business users like this at first. So one question is: Are the problems that need to be solved? Are they? Are we on a clear trajectory to solving them, or are there like is there fundamental science to be done, uh, or is it just kind of like Moore's law and bandwidth will get better and devices will get better? Are we on a clear path to um, these things getting I, much better? I'd say there's two sets of problems. There's the ones that we've been talking about, which I would say are very much so just engineering the snot out of them until yeah. you have this an interface that actually is preferable to what we're all used to. There is, and that's going to happen. I mean, it's a lot of work involved. I'm not yeah. going to not to diminish, diminish that, but there, but it's it's a, it's a standard hard engineering problem that we've that the community has solved before. Right. I mean, you know, we are constantly looking at the space, and no matter what category of problem you're looking at on that side of things, it feels like we're seeing regular improvements. Yeah, I would say like a lot of the problems in VR are tied to the performance of GPUs, and mm. those are on a Moore's Law style exponential curve. So that's everything from processing like field video, which is a big problem, to just the performance of games and just you know rendered experience in VR, and like that kind of speed is also part of it. If you want to talk about problems where uh, it is actual hard science, that's kind of where you're talking about the treating virtual reality in terms of actually a reality where it's tricking your brain and making you think it's a real one even though it's fake. So that's things like having a field of view that fills your entire vision and doesn't just, you know, look like kind of a box that or, you know, looking through a pair of swimming goggles uh, and seeing this virtual world, but making it look like it's an entirety of your world. Or things like how to what extent do we need uh, to trick the brain to have interesting haptic feedback to make it feel like when you touch something in the virtual world, you know, you yourself can feel it, whether it's gloves or a bodysuit or if it's a clever trick, you know, we've seen some things where it's uh, you wear kind of like a bracer on your arm and it taps you in different places. And because of the other sensory input of sound coming in, things that you're seeing, having that extra tap your, your brain kind of fills in the rest of what that sensation was and, uh, you know, makes you think that you interacted with something it brushed against you. Um, that really is a hard science problem. And that's where you see, like, Michael Abrash come on stage and talk about, uh, you know, illusions and how we trick the brain. Those are things where, you know, over the next 10 years, it's kind of hard to predict where we'll go, but it's probably going to be really transformative and go way beyond really what we're expecting today. That's true, but I think those things are kind of outside the really important problems that need to be solved. I think, you know, if you just had VR, uh, you know, very high quality headset with vi good visuals and a good controller, I think people would, would you know, like, you don't, like, I think they could live with that without having the haptic feedback, but that, that's just my... I think that's very true, for especially for these early use cases. I think that the hard science things are, coin are going to be what lead to the totally unexpected use cases that we're all going to be used to 10 years from now. One obvious use case for VR is games, and we've seen a lot of companies that are making games, and there will be a lot of great games on VR, um, and that might propel some of the early adoption. Um, uh, what are some of the other you know, potentially interesting apps? Yeah, I think um, live streaming of events is going to be like a really popular so use sports case. sports and music. Sports, yeah. music. But it might even be that you know, after this becomes popular, you have events which are just thrown for a mass audience at once. Um, so it's kind of like yeah. participation. We, we saw a demo, which is like um, uh, point cloud capture of mixed martial arts. So you have like, you can basically rewatch the mixed martial arts fight and um, walk around in the arena like you're the ref and like rewind it and see the whole thing. And same thing um, in know. extreme sports, like yeah. you know, you ski down the mountain. Or yeah, yeah, I'm not uh, personally into sports, but I could imagine people that are. It's pretty awesome. I mean, you see like the you watch like the Super Bowl and just like the new camera angles they have and things. It's just like that times 10x. Yeah, no, and this is something where you'll talk to people in the NBA or NFL, and you see on TV when you watch broadcasts, they'll do every hour or two, you'll see, uh, they'll take a really impressive play that happened and zoom in really close and turn around with like a matrix when Neo dodges the bullet, that yeah. scene where you go around and you zoom in and yeah. see like the interesting angle and how intense the face was on the guy who did it. Um, and right now they can, that takes like an hour of processing to get one second worth of footage. Yeah. And, you know, over the next couple of years as volumetric capture kind of, you know, it's invested in more, um, you know, new breakthroughs happen because people are really paying attention to it because of VR arising. Um, you'll start to see just events entirely recorded that way. Um, other interesting things in terms of content, 
Uh, and this is where, again, the blending of real world via light fields and rendered content and something that lives in a video game but looks real. Um, the idea of, and this is something that's also talked about with augmented reality, though, is like recording someone doing a task and you get to w observe them doing it in, also in a virtual space. And you, know, you could have that for repairing a car, let's say, where people uh, today will you know, set up their iPhone and record them changing the oil on a car and then put it on YouTube. Now you could set up a VR camera right you know, under the hood and say, here's exactly what you need to be doing, and here's the perspective that you'll have as you're doing the task. Um, and you know, I think that that kind of thing, again, like maybe in terms of user-generated content, we're a couple of years away just because there's not quite really great, you know, uh, prosumer tier, a couple hundred dollars or a few thousand dollar cameras that make that easy. But I think that that's going to be a big use case is um, not so much like, hey, here's, you know, a video of me out at the park with my dog, you know, as random things that people put on YouTube. Um, but things where, you know, you want to share an experience, whether it's something cool you did or, you know, a skill you have that you think is worth sharing with the world. That seems like something for VR where it'll make a lot of sense as that capture becomes more available. It's funny, you know, if you go back and you read about, like, when early PCs, everyone was trying to figure out what would you do with them. And they always talked about um, recipes for some reason. That was always the thing, which turned out to be kind of useful on the web. But, you know, not, not like the, the only use case for computers, for sure. And then with mobile, it was always these things where you could check uh, the stock market and the weather. That was what people thought would be the use case. And, like, and so I think games are sort of that version of VR where everyone thinks – is games and we'll kind of look back and laugh. I mean, I think it's basically my, my view. I mean, this is the obviously optimistic view is that it's basically anything where you'd want time travel or teleportation. Um, you can now do in VR, right? So for example, I think like ocean rift is a really cool app in, you know, you can use on Oculus, um, which as a, in the old paradigm of, of staring at a rectangle across the room, would have been really boring. You're just swimming around the ocean, right? But in VR, it's like I'm underwater. I'm in the ocean. There's a shark, and like it's when they show you a shark, for example, they they you can only see the shark when you're in a cage, because it's like super intense and scary if you weren't in a cage. And so, um, um, there's an example of just like the kind of thing which you know I think for example, instead of kids reading a really boring textbook about ancient Rome. Like, hey, let's go watch them build an aqueduct or something. And, like, it's just so much more interesting if you could go visit it, right? Like, school education will be just vastly more interesting. Um, hey, instead of talking on the phone or whatever, you know, texting each, your friend, like, let's go virtually sit together and watch. Um, I mean, that's actually one of the problems with VR, right, is that, like, from the outside, it looks so antisocial. Yet from the in, it's one of the technologies that the, 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 the contrast between what you're experiencing and how you look from the outside is, 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 is more heightened than anything else. Because it looks like you're, you know, the zombie sitting in a, um, you know, in a, in like a, in a chamber or something. But in fact, inside of it, you're like, it's the opposite. Yeah, I think one thing's really exciting is like what the descendant of like MMO games will be in VR. Yeah. So it's like, you know, in World of Warcraft, like half the attraction for a lot of people was like going around with that guild and like being a team. Yeah. And you know, in VR, you, you take that to the next level. You can go have like a whole village and you can all live in this in the game, and just have like I don't know. Well, it's, it's for people to dream up what's going to be right. in that game. And people, you know, you look back a decade and a half ago when, like, Second Life first came out, and people were on really bad broadband connections or dial-up, and they had really basic-looking avatars, and still hundreds of thousands of people, you know, were living virtual lives. They had virtual currencies. They were making different virtual objects that they would share with each other and pay mo real money for. Um, and... It's just not even a step change. It's a huge exponential change compared in terms of experience with what you could get uh, even with today's VR hardware if you, you know, really had the back-end infrastructure to support it um, and came up with, you know, a couple of use cases where, you know, that would bring you back every day. Um, it's also interesting to think of even business use cases where I think we've all had difficulties with Skype or Google Hangouts or, you know, any telepresence uh, experience where... Um, you know, either the connection was bad or, uh, you know, you could see the other person like checking their Gmail window while they were talking to you. Um, and I think we're only a couple years out from having things where it's tracking the muscles on your face, tracking the movement of your eyes, where your avatars could really reflect what you look like at that time. And you could do things like have an entire meeting where eight different people are in 
you know, different locations, but they all feel like they're in the same conference room and they're looking across the table and meet, mat matching each other's eye contact. And you can just have meetings that are much more effective than you would have over the phone or over, you know, uh, video, uh, video over IP. It's interesting because, you know, the Internet supposedly was going to make distributed teams work so well, yet, you know, still so many teams are not distributed and find that doesn't work. And one hypothesis is that it's just because you've, we've, we've, we haven't been able to sufficiently recreate all the important things of, of kind of interpersonal communication that happen um, in real life, but might, might be on the threshold of being able to do that. Sort of the intimacy, as you made, like making eye contact. And, you know, you think about why do salespeople fly across the country to close a multi-million dollar deal? Because people don't write multi-million dollar checks until you, you know, make eye contact and have this dinner. And there's sort of this emotional component to a lot of, um, a lot of uh, work um, uh, activities um, that just can't be captured on the, with current communication technologies. Yeah, and you know, I think you know, you mentioned Toy Box earlier, which is an Oculus Rift demo where uh, it's you with the Oculus Rift and the two touch controllers which track your hand movement and another person in another room, maybe, you know, down the hall or in a different building or wherever. And just with today's tracking plus the microphones built into the headset and the fact that they're headphones um, built into the headset that are pretty high quality, um, even without an avatar that looks like you, it's just like a translucent head and you know the hands that pretty much approximate how you gesticulate while you talk, it feels like you're there with the specific person you're talking yeah, to. That was like, one of the most surprising things to me about the demo was how, how it really felt like the person was there. Um, and you just can't. And fortunately, you just have to try to feel that. Right? It's just, you can't convince skeptics without trying it. But it's actually quite amazing how little you need to convince someone that that that. that. So, like, um, I remember seeing one Oculus demo. It was called like Nightclub or something. It was really just you were a cube, and your friend was a cube, and like you could just move your head, and then their cube would rotate. But it, even then, because the motion was so accurate, right? Because the motion the, was so and accurate, the, and the sound matters a lot. You know, that's one thing we can replicate perfectly is three dimensional sound. Right, the technology is right. there for that. And so, right, those things matter so much. Right. And then the the big technical problem for social VR is this kind of back-end infrastructure, the same technology they'd use in multiplayer games, which has become really important now. Right. Yeah. If, if you're going to have this metaver metaverse from science fiction, mm -hmm. how do you have tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people simultaneously in a world? Do you have instances, in, like in World of Warcraft, where people are, you know, could reach each other, but... For the most part, you're in like an area that only has a hundred people total, and you know if you go to this other area, then you know you load onto a different like part of the server, and you know, or do you have you know something where it's simulating all of it, and there's you know different shards um, where you're breaking it down to smaller bits. We have yeah, we have an investment here in Probable, um, which is I think of as um, you know if you read Ready Player One, which. Hopefully the listeners have read it's a canonical VR book. Um, the uh, there's a section where they describe the system called Oasis that's in, that's featured in the book. Um, and there's two parts of the system. There's the headset, and then there's the back end infrastructure, which lets you create these kind of unlimited um, virtual spaces. And that's something which needs to be created. There are other facets that are maybe less pressing, um, but will also lead to really interesting possibilities. For instance, IBM just announced that they're going to try to use Watson to provide uh, basically an AI interaction system for a game based on an anime about a VR MMO. Uh, so the idea there is um, you'd be able to interact with characters in the game, kind of like how in games, let's say from Bioware, where you can choose different dialogue options and get different reactions based on how you're response was, you know, was it aggressive or were you trying to be conciliatory? Um, you could have things where you actually talk to that character and it tries to read what you're saying. Yeah, this is probably why Amazon actually just released a game engine because which has connections to AWS. So they, I guess they want to, they, the plan is to have that as the back end or at least be part of it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about augmented reality, um, but, you know, which, which, um, uh, there's things like Microsoft has the HoloLens, and then there's companies like Magic Leap. Um, uh, you know, and and that's some people are more excited about AR than VR. Um, I think you could argue that there's a spectrum, right? That they're not as sharply distinguished as people say, in the sense that you can, you know, VR will very soon sort of scan the room around you and put you back in the room and add things onto the room, and um, and so really it comes down to sort of 
there's a mixture in what you're viewing between what's real and what's virtual. And the one extreme is it's all virtual. The other extreme is nothing and it's all real. And then there's stuff in between. And so what do you guys think about, um, about what's going to happen in AR in the near future? Well, uh, Microsoft actually uh, at TED just announced that they're delaying the consumer release of HoloLens. Oh, right. So uh, they, I think, realized... Did they realize, a date as to when? No. So they're going to continue with their, basically, like, for enterprise slash people who want to develop early augmented reality applications, mm-hmm. they're going to sell a $3,000, you know, the equivalent of the mm-hmm. Google Glass and, uh, you know, Explorer edition, uh, one to just experiment with. And then I think they realized that they needed to have kind of... Uh, kill. Uh, at least one killer app for consumers. You know, a use case where you buy this thing, whether it's a thousand dollars as a consumer product or actually goes all the way up to three thousand. Who knows? But something where you actually want to use it as a consumer. Um, I think that that's kind of reflective of the rest of the space, and that it doesn't quite feel like there's any applications today for regular people where it makes sense. There are some things that um, feel well, compelling. Well, it's, instance, a, it's a harder technical problem too, though, because you have to. To be able to put a virtual object in the real world, you have to interpret and understand the real world, right? Which right. is a hard machine vision problem. Right. This is falls into uh, kind of the class of technology is SLAM, simultaneous localization yeah. and mapping, where you have to be aware of exactly what the room looks like around you and then constantly be uh, checking where is the headset and the, therefore the viewer in relation yeah. to that. Room. Well, and where is the vir- – and if I have this virtual soda can, I have to know it's a real table and the table can support it and the physics are right and there's a whole set of problems that, that are – that are uh, in addition to what you need to do for for regular VR. Right. So you're doing the compute of rendering what that virtual object looks like, and then you're also doing that slam work yeah. of figuring out where it should all be. Um, and those are both really hard. Um, but that said, it feels like there are some you know potential enterprise use cases. Again, going back to the training example, um, while training in VR is compelling, the idea of uh, being able to have something overlaid on top of the task you're trying to do, yeah. pointing out how so you should So you're be fixing using. an airplane engine and overlaid on the engine is is like the instructions for how to do it or whatever the Right, or, or maybe it has, uh, for instance, with the whole Internet of Things trend, there's sensors on everything. Maybe it's constantly giving you a readout of different sensors so you know, oh, I just turned this uh, crank and it actually you know raised the pressure too much on that dial. Um, I should actually probably bring that back, and you can know all of that in real time. I think one interesting thing about AR versus VR is if, you know, VR is, you can only spend like a a small fraction of your day in VR, um, perhaps. So, but I guess with AR, the potential is you can have it on all the time. And perhaps that's what gets people more excited about AR and VR. But whether that's actually going to happen, that's actually how it's going to play out is really debatable. And then there's certain things where... At first glance, it seems like something is a use case, like the idea of 3D modeling, but having it sh- the model sh- floats next to you in the real world and you can look at it from different angles. That is kind of compelling, except for the way, you know, what's nice about editing that all in VR is you get to see the final context of what you'd have that model in. So if you're building a game world, for instance, you could see how that model fits in with lighting and, you know, the particular shaders that you're using. Does it match the rest of the environment? Whereas just having an arbitrary 3D model floating around may not actually be that useful. Right. And the other thing is like the upper bound for how much time you can spend in VR is how much time you spend looking at screens anyway. And that's, I would say, like maybe 20% of your working out waking hours is not unreasonable. And you could say that, you know, what makes mobile devices like smartphones so powerful is it can fill kind of the empty times throughout your day. It's, you know, you're not sitting down for, uh, you know, okay, now it's Facebook time. I've got an hour free. I'm going to go on Facebook. It's no, okay, I'm between tasks. I was walking to the bank, but it turns out there was 20 people in line. So I'm going to go check my updates and maybe send a snap. Um, Whereas, you know, with VR, you're not going to fill empty time. AR, you know, the case could be made that you could use it in that way. As fans of VR, what do we hope um, happens in 2016? Uh, well, a recent announcement that got me really excited for uh, what's going to happen in VR in 2016 is the idea or that Samsung is going to be providing uh, Gear VRs to the first 300,000 people who um, order a Samsung Galaxy S7 uh, through their site. They're going to be doing a similar offer for people who buy through other channels. So we're going to see potentially millions of people get a VR headset for free in the next couple of months. Um, And again, while that's not kind of the ideal of what we consider, you know, what VR experiences should be, uh, Gear VR 
is enough of a taste of what VR can be like at the you know at the high end when you have a comfortable headset that you're not holding up that you know sits on your head and you can play some games, you can watch some videos and be pretty comfortable. That's exciting just because people will understand, oh, this is possible. Um, I would say at the higher end, what I'm really excited for is to see both how Oculus Rift and Vive do. They're launching at a fairly high price, you know, $600 for the Rift, $800 for the Vive. Um, but they're coming as if you've already tasted VR, it's a pretty compelling bundle. Rift coming with, you know, a game that satisfies some hardcore people with E Valkyrie, but also you'll be able to show it to your kids with uh, Lucky's Tale, which is like a Mario style platformer. But then on the Vive, they're going to have these experiences that really take advantage of room scale. So things like Job Simulator, where uh, the idea is you're in an office and you can do a bunch of like silly behaviors, uh, but the it's basically you know you if you went into an office and could do anything and there were no repercussions, you know it's it, like Grand Theft Auto for offices, right? Yeah, it, <laughs> it's, it's mundane Grand Theft Auto, um, and just looking at the different, you know, the doors that will open up in people's minds and understanding what's possible. I don't think that either of them has to do particularly well. You know, we don't, we won't have to see a Connect style 10 million units in 60 days. I, I don't think that's going to be the case, but it's going to make a lot more people understand where it could go. I guess the the main thing is um, that I was like, what kind of games are going to be on VR? Because that is the initial market, right? And so this year is going to be all about gamers. And I mean, I'm just curious to see what the VR content will be like and um, whether you know people are going to get really excited about games. And I think that would be really good for VR if, if uh, people really want to play these. I think the key, for me, the key metric is not number of units sold um, on the high end. It's the number of demos given, kind of like it's how many people get to try high end VR, which I just think will create a whole new wave of um, um, excitement and, and new companies and new content. And so, you know, this is the year people finally get to try what we're talking about. Um, and uh, um, I've... I have yet to see anyone. I, I've seen a number. I love this, the ones that just went in Gizmodo last week, and there was one time before of like the most skeptical people on earth who finally try the high end stuff, and they and universally get converted. And so the third paragraph is generally an apology for all yeah. the negative things they've said. I made yeah. fun of everybody. I thought it was so dumb. It was 3D TV, and I just tried it, and oh my god! And yeah, that's just, that will be. I think. I hope 10 million people will be saying that this year. That's my hope. So this is where the fact that it'll be in. You know, the Oculus Rift will be in Best Buy starting in April. That's really exciting. The challenge there is having a quality demo in terms of, you know, these are brand new experiences and people generally need a little bit of guidance when they need to train the salespeople and everything else. Yeah. And that's where will you get salespeople that truly understand, like, here are the pros, you know, here are the best kinds of experiences you're going to have, not overselling it and, you know, convincing people they're buying a Matrix rig, but saying, you know, you're going to, it's going to be like, a gaming-ish experience, but, you know, more immersive than anything you've ever tried before. You know, having this uh, practical kind of balanced approach to selling it, um, that's kind of a big unknown about how well that'll be executed on. But even the fact that it'll be available, you know, there's going to be a whole new class of early adopters who just haven't been able to go to E3 or the Game Developers Conference or Oculus Connect who are finally, like, they will go out there and they will find an Oculus Rift and they will try it on and they will be sold. The other thing is, um, this is the year that creators are going to figure out what exactly to do with VR. Like, we've already seen, like, a lot of progress um, in the film film and gaming community of, like, how to tell stories, um, you know, how to edit, um, like, good music videos or games or, like, short film. And I I think we're just going to see more of that. And that's just another thing which is going to convince people of the potential of VR and um, figure out the medium. All right, Saku and Kyle, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.